Okay. Is anyone using Telegraph? Just a couple of hands. Okay. All right. We don't need to go over that again, do we? So for those that are not familiar with Telegraph, in fact, you can, I guess you kind of seen a demo of it a second ago, but what I'll do very quickly. Let's just create a new Telegraph configuration and then show you what it does. So first we have an agent configuration. I'm going to set an interval. The interval just means collect uh, metrics from the plugins on this, spec on this specific interval. So here is two seconds. I can enable as many inputs as I want. So here I'm going to do CPU inputs and I can enable as many outputs as I want. So here we'll do file. For files, I'm actually just going to write to standard out so that we can see it working. And what we have there is a very simple telegraph configuration. So all this is going to do is every two seconds, collect CPU metrics and write them to standard out. We run telegraph, point it to the TOML file, and then after two seconds, Oh, I never changed the flush interval. Okay, after 10 seconds, we'll have a whole screen of metrics. There we go. That's all Telegraph is, right? So it's a Go binary, has plugins to fetch metrics from one or more locations, and can write them to one or more locations. That's the entire precursor. That's all you need to, to know about Telegraph to follow along with the rest of the talk. The Telegraph is plugin based. There are currently a lot of plugins. Um, at the moment, there are 169, in fact, I think it's now higher than that, input plugins for Telegraph. Input plugins means Telegraph knows 169 pieces of software it can go and get metrics from. And hopefully, that is most of the software that you're using in your infrastructure. On the output side, it can write to over 35 locations. Again, that could be InfluxDB or Prometheus or Datadog and so forth. Processors, power source serializers, and aggregators all allow you to transform those metrics in memory before it leaves Telegraph to one of the outputs. So as you can see, there's a lot of plugins here. It is one of our most contributed to and successful open source projects because it's actually really easy for anyone to go and write a new input-output processor and so forth. The actual amount of code that you need to write is, is under 200 lines of code for a basic plugin, which is great. It's a very fast moving project. So May last year, we released 1.10, and we're always adding inputs. You know, people want to get metrics from new and crazy places, so they show up all the time. This was, uh, I think Google were contributing quite heavy at this point, and we had a few things from Amazon, and we added some new serializers. The following lease came in June, right? so just a couple of months after, and again, a whole new selection of inputs of new plugins and new softwares that people want metrics from. I added the GitHub one, just FYI. The outputs, um, the health output's really cool. We're going to talk about that later. And um, we also support writing to syslog for anyone that's still using that technology. And we added some new aggregators. September, a little bit longer. We're still adding even more input plugins. Oh, I forgot to disable my notifications. We'll just power through. Um, we can now parse all the Docker logs from the Docker host on the machine. We support log stash. Outputs, exec, allows you to actually send arbitrary mm -hmm. metrics to arbitrary programs on the machine. So take all these metrics in and execute a Python script, and that'll determine where to put them. And then some new processors to do even more in-memory transformations. 1.13 came in December. Again, more inputs. Right. Hopefully you're seeing some warning signs here as well. Like, really cool, you're supporting all these plugins, but there's got to be a cost. Of course there is. So one thing I sat down, I joined Influx 14 months ago, and I was like, which plugins do people even use? <laughs> and nobody could tell me. And the problem is there's no telemetry on Telegraph whatsoever. We have no idea what people are using it for. We don't even know if it's worth maintaining certain plugins or if anyone's even using them. But you can, as you can imagine, for an open source project where you know, we're limited on the amount of people we have working on it, how to prioritize these plugins is actually a really big challenge. So I did what any developer would do, and I went, right, how can I work this out? So I went to github.com, I searched for telegraph.conf, and found 3,249 files, which I thought was great. Unfortunately, 
GitHub doesn't allow you to pull down 3,249 files from their API. So I used a sample of 1,000, which was the maximum I could get from GitHub. No matter what I did to my search terms, I could never get any more than the first hundred, uh, first thousand telegraph comps. That's my word shape. So we're just going to consider this a sample, and I'm going to share what I found from analysing all of these configurations. So first, no surprise, 72% of the people using Telegraph are writing to InfluxDB. 5% were writing to a file. Um, there are actually quite a few use cases for that that are very interesting, so that's cool. 2% are actually using the Prometheus integration. I was hoping that would be higher. And only 06 are using Kafka, which I found really strange because whenever I go to a conference, is I can't go more than 10 minutes without someone saying Kafka. So um, people just aren't using Kafka with Telegraph. Maybe that's the take home there. I'm not sure. With the configuration options, most people use the default of 10 seconds interval. So 73% uh, and you know, one second, five second, one minute and 30 seconds. They're all really standard. No surprises here, but you know, still got to share the numbers. The round interval, what that means is no matter when you start Telegraph, it's going to round the collection interval up to be on the second. So if you have a 10 second collection interval, well, that, it's actually going to run at 10 seconds, 20 seconds, 30 seconds, 40 seconds, 50 seconds on air. Um, most people use that because it's the default, so that made sense. The jitter, 90% of people aren't using this. So I guess this comes down to either people just don't know what it is or they just don't care. But you can actually apply a random jitter to the Telegraph collection because what happens in your large infrastructure environment is if you've got 2,000 hosts, all with a Telegraph, all with round interval sets true because we've just seen that 90% of people do that, that's 2,000 machines hitting your InfluxDB every 10 seconds or every two seconds or every five seconds. What the jitter does is actually <coughs> calculates a random delay and offset for each host and then they all come in at different times so you have a nice constant flow of data instead of dosing yourself essentially. Um, so if there's one take home, in fact there's going to be many take homes, but one of them is you should use jitter in your telegraph config. I'm at host name. Now this is not very interesting because the default is to keep it false, um, but what I'm going to try and take home from this is that if you're in a container or Kubernetes environment, how many of you care about the pod name or the VM name that only lives for 10 minutes? Nobody. So what I'm kind of trying to guess here or extrapolate is that most people are not running Telegraph inside a container environment, otherwise this would be much higher for false, uh, for true. Or people are just cardinality bombing themselves and not really caring. Either way, it's a bit of a challenge. Um, but if you do run Telegraph inside of a container or in Kubernetes, Make sure you turn that to true. As far as output plugins go, 71% of the people just use one output. A couple other people use multiples. As far as the input plugins go, this got a little bit crazy. Um, some people use one, some people use nine, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> one person is using 56. Like <laughs> I really need to dig into that one a bit more, and I need to find a username on GitHub and actually reach out to them for a conversation. I'm hoping they were just playing around, but 56 inputs on a single telegraph is insane. Um, yeah. Well, when I get the answers, I'll share them all. But we do have a very even spread, and this backs up the omit hostname container thing, right? Most people are using telegraph for CPU, memory, disk, system, etc. These are Linux system plugins. So chances are they're not running it in a container because they're running it on bare metal hosts to collect bare metal infrastructure stuff or even VMs, but they still want all the basic system Linux stuff. So, but what was cool was 28% are using Docker plugins, so we know of this thousand sample, you know, a good percentage of them do have Docker running on their host, even if Telegraph isn't in it. So what I want to talk about is multiple outputs. Um, this is probably one of the most important things you can do with Telegraph, because what people do is they build these really sophisticated, really cool monitor and pipelines that write to one place, and then they never know if that's broken or not. Who watches the watchman is the age old question in infrastructure monitoring. So what InfluxDB can actually do is you can configure multiple outputs. So here I'm writing to InfluxDB1 and InfluxDB2. That could be multiple InfluxDB1s if I'm baked all into the InfluxDB ecosystem. It could be Datadog, New Relic, CloudWatch, um, anything else, or even just Postgres if you want to write to Postgres. So using multiple outputs just gives you the ability to obviously dual write or multi-write to two or three more locations, 
But then you can actually build correlations between those. You can actually check, do, are my metrics the same in them all? And identify problems in one of your output plugins, or one of your monitoring sticks. Remote configuration is an underused feature because it was quite new. I think it's about nine months old, but none of the configs were using this setting whatsoever. And you may have seen this during the InfluxDB2 example, where I can actually specify dash config or dash dash config and give it a remote location for where that configuration lives. And I never have to actually do any provision configuration or provision management on that file to get it onto a machine. What I actually do most of the time now is store all of my telegraph.confs on GitHub or in a GIST, and I use the raw access URL. It's very rarely I pull it down manually to my machine. In fact, that's one of the ones I use already. So, you know, you can drop in the raw.github user content and a telegraph.conf. Of course, please don't store secrets inside of your telegraph.com file, and especially if you're going to store them in GitHub or somewhere like that. Um, Telegraph does support interpolation of uh, bash environment variables or zshell environment variables. So as long as they exist in your shell or you prefix the command, you can actually inject your secrets that way. Um, I did find a couple of the telegraph.coms on GitHub with secrets, but I did notify the owner, so it's okay. After testing their infrastructure, of course. And this is just one of the examples. It doesn't always have to be secrets. If you want to make your interval configurable, depending on the host, or just because you want to do debugging of Telegraph Live, you can pass that through as an environment variable. You can also set defaults. And of course, the secret stuff, like an influxdb v2 token, should always, always use string interpolation or variable interpolation. Output resiliency. <coughs> so. More and more people are adopting Telegraph, which is great. And more and more people are using multiple outputs, which is great. The problem is you're starting to store even more of your metrics inside Telegraph's memory. So you have to make sure that you work out what is a sensible metric buffer limit for you. Now, what the metric buffer limit does is Telegraph will batch up the metrics in the, fin in the event that any of your outputs fails. So if you're into InfluxDB1 and InfluxDB2 and InfluxDB is down, it will actually, to the size of this limit, store those metrics in an InfluxDB2 buffer, and then it'll pop the ones off that are the oldest if you actually hit that limit. But it just means that if you have to reboot InfluxDB or Prometheus or anything like that, you never ever lose metrics. And it's one of the most important settings you could probably enable as well. And you can set it as high as you want. If you've got a 32 gig, 64 gig RAM machine, set it to 500,000. That's fine. If you have, obviously, if you're on a Raspberry Pi, you might want to tweak that a little bit. And can you measure how much data you send just to uh, be able to uh, to tweak this? Yes, you can. Mm -hmm. So I guess I'm going to jump back quickly. Um, the metric buffer limit is per output. So if you have a metric buffer limit of 50,000 and five outputs, then that's going to be 250,000 metrics in memory. Make sure you have the RAM to account for that. There's also an internal plugin that I'll talk about shortly, which actually allows you to monitor how much of that buffer has been consumed, and then you can tweak it as you go. So I want to talk about Telegraph architectures. Um, you know, this is kind of where most people are. They run Telegraph. It's configured to go out to get network stats or bare metal VM stats or software dependencies. As well as the metric buffer, you can do batching. So you know, if you're going to have a, if you're doing high resolution data, one second or milliseconds or nanoseconds, you don't want to write that constantly in a stream of metrics. You maybe want to batch it to 10,000, 50,000, 100,000, and send them in groups. It's just much more performant. So Telegraph can do batching and the buffering to InfluxDB, and then our application is written directly to InfluxDB. This is where most people are when I speak to them. The problem here being, this goes down, Telegraph does okay, it does batching and, and buffering, but our real-time application metrics that we're pushing are now all being lost as well. Is this familiar to anyone, people doing this? So what if we could have the batching and buffering capabilities of Telegraph for the real-time push metrics that we have in our application? And surprisingly, this is like two lines in a Telegraph configuration, but just people aren't using it. So. There is a plugin called InfluxDB Listener for Telegraph that actually emulates or proxies the InfluxDB1 API. If you want to do two, you can actually just use the HTTP Listener, which is a more generic thing, and you can actually hook that up to any application. So um, there's some really cool quirks there. 
And yeah, uh, the thing to note about the InfluxDB listener is that while it proxies the V1 API, it does only proxy the right endpoint, so it's not an attack surface. People can't exploit your telegraph to create users or databases on your DB. All those commands will return a 204 OK or accepted, but none of it ever hits your database. So even just from a security standpoint, proxying all your rights through Telegraph actually gets you a lot of benefits and removes all those admin functions. And this is the two lines you need to turn it on. Right? I'm sure we can all grok that pretty quickly, but we just say inputs and FoxDB listener. Uh, the service address just means we can specify um, uh, Ethernet adapter or Wi-Fi adapter we want to listen on. So you can use the IP address or blank for all of them. And then the port, if you're using a drop-in proxy for InfluxDB, just use InfluxDB port 8086. And there's a really cool side effect from adopting this model. Is that if you want to start playing with InfluxDB2, you can use the Telegraph InfluxDB proxy to use the V1 client libraries, even though we haven't got a lot of official client libraries for V2 yet. And this is our preferred route. We're encouraging a lot of people to do this because you can just use the InfluxDB proxy right to InfluxDB2 and to InfluxDB1. So if you're thinking InfluxDB2 looks kind of cool, well, now you can actually dip your toe in the water by just injecting Telegraph as a proxy right into both. And then when you're happy with InfluxDB2, kill InfluxDB1. If you're not happy with InfluxDB2, you just kill it. No harm, no foul. The other resiliency-based listener is the HTTP listener. And this will accept any HTTP traffic. All you have to do is tell it the format that it's coming in. So if you're sending JSON, you just tell it it's JSON. You can specify the path that you want to accept writes on. So if you're trying to replicate or proxy some other application that you're familiar with, you can also specify any headers to accept or reject, and as well as HTTP methods. So you might not want to accept a head, but you might want to accept a post and not a get, et cetera, et cetera. The configurations for this are all in the example repository. Uh, the, the examples in the README of each of this plugin. That's the words. And again, very very simple to enable this, and you get a whole lot of bang for your buck. We turn on the listener. We use the service address, exact same format as the InfluxDB listener. Only this time we have to tell it the format. If you're not familiar with Telegraph, the format can be JSON, XML. I think. Uh, CSV, and there might even be pro robust support, I can't remember. There, there's a whole bunch of stuff anyway. Uh, yeah, you can, <laughs> if you're using JSON, there is a couple of extra bits you have to tweak. Um, so you have to tell it the JSON key name. So if you want the measurement name to be inside the JSON body, you have to point it to it. And you also have to tell it what tags are in the JSON. Right? It's not gonna do that by default because tags are expensive. So you explicitly have to say, these properties within this JSON, I want index and set as tags. Anything as an integer will automatically be added as a field. But you can also turn them off too if you want. Um, so yeah, there's, these slides are already online. I think I'll tweet them out when I finish and there's a link in the docs there. All right, so when I joined 14 months ago, I already seen how cool Telegraph was. Like within the first six weeks, I was like, okay, this is a really killer tool. But let's talk about the plugin thing again. It's currently over 200 plugins and growing. In the last year, we've added, I think, another 40 plugins. The problem with Go is there isn't really any way to modularize that build. Right? It's really painful, which means the binary size of Telegraph, every time we accept a new plugin, goes up. And not just by the code for the plugin, but all of its dependencies. Right? When I added the GitHub plugin, the GitHub dependency I was using for the API just to make it a bit easier to work with was 6 meg. Right, and that's, you have to decide, does this really make sense? And I thought no. So I started working on a project, I think it was around March last year, called Bring Your Own Telegraph. Now my background is obviously containers and Kubernetes, so I wanted to provide <laughs> container tooling to give people the option to build their own telegraph. So, plugins coming across, yep, covered you. So Docker image LS, the default telegraph image is 254 megabytes. It's not crazy, right? I mean, if anyone's done containers long enough, you've worked for that company that has a two gig deployment image, right? Who nervous laughs because the people do still have that. Um, what I got for my BYOT by default was a 15.2 megabit image. So which one do you want in your infrastructure? Especially as you scale and you're pulling that over the wire. One thing people always forget about Google Cloud and AWS is that they charge you for the network. 
So, you know, you pull 10,000 of those telegraphs, you're paying a pretty penny. Now, how does it work? Well, you just use multi-stage builds. If you're not familiar with that, I'll try and explain it as best as I can as I go. But the first from statement is my special purpose-built tool that has loads of on-build instructions that knows how to build telegraph. So that layer will build a binary, and then we pass it on to the next layer, which is a really small alpine. Is that a question? Uh -huh. This is a really small alpine image, which is under 5 meg. Right? The default telegraph uses Ubuntu as a base. It starts at 70 meg. So already I have 165 meg. We then copy from the build layer the telegraph configuration and the binary, and we configure the entry point. So as long as you've already got containers in your infrastructure and you know how to build a CI job that will build this image every time you change the config, you're one step on your way to having a really lightweight telegraph binary. Now I've got some links. Let's have a look. So this is how it works. So we start from Golang. We install git dep and make because Telegraph still currently uses dep, but we're migrating to Go modules. I then wrote some go, uh, gen.go code, which actually generates all of the plugin architecture for Telegraph without the crap you don't want, which is really cool. And then all of the on build instructions are just the normal Telegraph build instructions. I know it seems like a lot, but you never have to use this file. I'm just showing you it so you know the, how the sausage is made, I guess. I don't really know. If we click on the example, this is the Docker file I've already shown you, but what I actually want to show you is that this repository just has a telegraph directory with a plain old telegraph configuration. So all it needs is your standard TOML file, and it, and it works out all the rest by scanning this file, loading the plugins, loading the outputs, and then regenerating the telegraph build system. Now some interesting stuff. Da -da -da. Try that again. Hmm. Oh, I'm on the wrong account. I ran tests <laughs> many, many months ago, and it normally remembers, I don't have to drill down. You did not select the date. Oh. Right, tell you what, why don't we just type 19? And apply. Okay, this is the range I want. Oh, I was supposed to do it for them all. All right, what I'll show you then very poorly is that the first graph is allocated bytes. What actually happened with bringing your own telegraph is that the number of allocated bytes dropped by a factor of 10 just by not using the plugins that we're not using. The really cool bit down here, this is the gather time. And what we can see here, if I kind of maybe if I zoom in a bit more, is that the gather time with BYOT was actually faster and more consistent. These spikes are the standard telegraph, and they actually have, because of the amount of stuff on the, the heap, random spikes where something where some plugin may go from five nanoseconds up to five milliseconds or some big jump. That all smoothed out with the BYOT stuff. And then the number of objects on the heap was also reduced by a factor of 10. So by just not using the static build with all 200, 300 plugins and using <coughs> something that's custom built, you get a whole load of performance benefits that otherwise wouldn't be there. And I'll need to save a link to that dashboard at some point. That's annoying. All right, let's go back. So let's go back to our architecture. You know, we've got our application going through the proxy. We're still collecting all our stuff here. We're writing to InfluxDB. Everything's as good as they can get, right? Well, not really. Now that we have this concept of bringing your own telegraph, which is super lightweight, really small, memory footprint is even substantially less than the normal telegraph, is why would we centralize this? 
and have a single point of failure. What we actually want to do is run a telegraph at every edge point that we can. Run a telegraph on every machine. Run a telegraph on every sidecar. Every pod is a sidecar. Just run telegraphs everywhere in your infrastructure. What that means is that we can actually take advantage of the batching and buffering at each edge location. So if you have an application that is high risk, that deals with financial transactions, do you ever want to lose a metric or log or trace from that service? No. So that's going to have a much larger buffer to handle a longer failure period. Your user application that just does a profile fetch or something, maybe not as high risk, and you can actually lower the memory buffer there and accept some variability. So you can actually tweak, configure, and prioritize your entire metric pipeline with Telegraph in this configuration. But how do we monitor Telegraph now that we've got not we've not blah, 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 no longer got one of them, but 20, 30, 60, or 100 of them? And that's where the internal plugin comes in. So there are only two metrics that are worth watching. There's the buffer size. So what size is my buffer? And am I ever going to hit the limit? You actually probably want to send a notification saying this telegraph on this machine and this data center is approaching your buffer limit and may hit it within the next 15 minutes. Someone should probably take a look. You definitely want to alert on metrics dropped. You need to know if you're dropping metrics at any point in your metric pipeline. So those two metrics are easily to turn on. You just enable the internal plugin. Those will all be written to InfluxDB. And can you change your value without restarting Telegraph? I would always have the internal thing on, but right into a very short retention policy, so the, da the data gets expired after 10, 15 minutes. You're just using this for reactive stuff. Does that make sense? Yeah. Can, we have, um, can we change the configuration on the fly remotely? Or? What, why would you change it? Just assume that uh, the first size is, reach, is reaching 90% uh, <laughs> and uh, you don't want to stop because you don't want to lose anything, but you want to double the size. So yes and no. You can send a sig hop to Telegraph and it will flush your metrics out, restart it with the new value. Um, but if your output is down, you will lose metrics. Okay. So no. I would monitor the buffer size, try and predict when it's going to fill and try and fix the problem with the output first and then look for other options. But yeah, that we are working on support for the sig hop not to restart the plugins, um, but there are some quirks with that that haven't really been worked out yet, but we're trying to make it seamless. And I assume you would need to add some API to the plugins to be sure that they, uh, to they, they reload the values which yeah, the, the only problem is service input types, which are long running processes or go routines inside of the plugins. The fetch and forget ones, mm. the really simple plugins, there's no problem there. But if you keep a persistent connection open to fetch MySQL metrics, reloading that is the challenging part. So we actually re stop that and restart it. Um, but all your other plugins would be okay. Mm. Now, I mentioned this one earlier as a new output. Um, because I think it's really, really cool. And again, not a single config that I scanned was using this, and nobody I've ever spoken to is using this either. But in a dynamic environment with ephemeral pods or containers or whatever, this becomes very useful. So let's talk about health checks. Am I talking to a room of developers, by the way? I'm not sure. Who writes code? Okay, most of you. <laughs> um, so I, I've been a developer for 15 years, and I'll hold my hands up and say I've done this before, but I meet even more people than me that do this. And what I want to say is this is not a health check, right? Just saying that the path is health and returning an OK and testing one route of your application does not tell you your, ha your application is healthy, right? This is a sham. But still, that's what we do, because it's the easiest way to say, well, if my framework is accepting the HTTP request and I've got a response, most of the things in the middle might be OK. Um, but that's not really good enough anymore. And this is where the Telegraph health output comes in. What it actually allows you to do is you know, run a HTTP endpoint that actually monitors metrics within Telegraph. <coughs> and then you can do comparisons on those metrics in real time. So I can actually say for my web, my web service, monitor the response time of all my requests and start failing this health check if anything goes above 300 milliseconds. So now I can actually have much deeper understanding. Now this is a very naive implementation. I could actually use multiple metrics. I could do means and aggregates and try and work out if 98% of my traffic is underneath 300 milliseconds. And in a future version, this will support a Flux script, which will be very cool. So this plugin is really awesome. 
And it means that my health check is now pointing to Telegraph instead of my application, but I'm using the real-time metrics of my application to determine the health. Much nicer. And now we're moving on towards the more complicated environmental setup. It's like, okay, we have billions of telegraphs and we've got Kubernetes and sidecars and pods and all sorts. Eventually people want to do more with their metrics, right? Writing them to InfluxDB is great, but what if I want to do something with Spark or Elasticsearch or some other ML pipeline? And this is where Kafka comes in. Everybody has a Kafka cluster now. So our architecture now expands again. So we have telegraphs in all of our edge locations that run a mix of software, of VMs, bare metals, networks. We have our applications speaking directly to a telegraph. And all of these telegraphs are writing to Kafka. And then we use telegraph to consume Kafka <laughs> and write it back to InfluxDB. Because the beauty is there, once it's into Kafka, any other tooling that I want to use is now freely available to me, which is fantastic. It also means I can scale my telegraphs on the consumer side. right? You know, if our influx DB goes down, or we want to write to, you know, we want to enhance the architecture and redund redundancy there. Uh, if we're not uh, consuming the Kafka topics fast enough, we can horizontally scale that and then keep going. So this is where you're going to get from, you know, millions of points per second into the hundreds of millions of points per second or billions of points per second, depending on what you're working on. So Kafka makes things very, very interesting. What about serverless? Oh, well, that was a good slide. <laughs> um, I have a pull request open right now. What I when I speak to people, they really like Telegraph, but they maybe don't want a long running process in their infrastructure. They want to know how I can use the serverless approach. Uh, I have a pull request pending, which actually allows you to pass in a run once flag to Telegraph that runs and fetches all the metrics and then shuts back down again and could be scheduled on a serverless framework like serverless, open faz, etc. I used to have it compiled on my machine, I'll check, but if not, I'll send a video, that I'll tweet out a link to the PR. Uh, and now we're going to take a look at a very complicated demo that shows off that last architecture, I think, yeah, this. And if you thought the last demo was a bit complicated, this one is insane, but let's see what happens. So. Uh, doo -doo. What I have running, uh, the only important bits are we have Chronograph, InfluxDB1, Kafka, a Python web application, a Telegraph consumer of Kafka, a Telegraph at the edge publishing to Kafka, and then some Kafka crap as well that is needed. Right? Now you don't need to understand every line here, it's just this architecture. Right? I have loads, I have a telegraph right into Kafka, one consumer from Kafka, and so forth. Uh, and I can... And I need to run my authentication for InfluxDB, and reload, and now I can log in. So this is my response time over the last five minutes, refreshing every five seconds for my Python application. Uh, for the people that are familiar with oscillation, you can see there's maybe a problem with this Python application, right? My response time is going up and up and up and up. It's dying, or no, it's not dying. It's going back to good and coming up and up and then going back down and going up and up. So let's take a look at this Python application. And somehow, through a very dodgy pull request, oh, go ABS code. Is that we managed to inject a random sleep into my Python code? And you'll see that it's actually incrementing for every request. So on the first request, there's no sleep. The second request, it sleeps for one. The second request, it sleeps for two, and so forth until it gets to a five-second sleep. My Telegraph Health Check plugin is looking at the metric and actually killing this container and it's being restarted based on metrics instead of an arbitrary health check. What's also very cool about this Python application is it's using the v1 client library, but we're still writing to InfluxDB v2. Hmm. 
now let's take a look at the internal write metrics. So this is our buffer size and our metrics dropped. Uh, that's going to be impossible to read. But what we actually have, in fact, with raw data work. Metrics dropped, all zeros. We've never dropped a single metric. Our buffer size hovers around 16, 17, 18. So we are using a bit of our buffer, but that's just because we're delaying our flush to batch things together. But we've never dropped any metrics. So if I come over here, kill Kafka. I'll just take a second, turn off this, and our auto refresh is on. What we're actually going to see is we're going to no longer get any updates for a few seconds. Any questions so far while we wait on this to buffer? Um, my question for the, when you, when you specify the, t the telegraph minus minus config, so once for all, so it will not check about the, if the file you link with is updated or what, so it's just... It always pulls it down. Yeah. All right, so you can see now we've got some blackness, there's nothing here, we're missing metrics, but of course our pipeline is mostly resilient. So I'm going to bring all this back up. And hopefully we see most of that filled. Well, not. We should see our metric buffer rise beyond 17. The max is set to 50. It'll cap out and we will see some dropped metrics. The only reason we're seeing dropped metrics is because I set the buffer so low so we could see it being used. There we go. Perfect. Now let's go back to our raw data. Uh, metrics dropped. The bottom one's there, 21, 37, 55. So we did drop metrics because we have a very small buffer. <coughs> and our buffer size, if we see at the bottom, hit the max of 50. And that's why the metrics were being dropped. So those two parameters, very, very useful. Uh, now, what people always tell me is there aren't client libraries for their favorite programming language. They're running on really weird architectures or systems. They don't know how to get metrics into InfluxDB. Uh, what I want to show you is that it's actually super, super easy using weird plugins to do that. So I'm now inside of my Telegraph and I have a couple of scripts here. So tcurl. It's going to echo out the command that it's running. This is using curl to send metrics from any Linux shell to Telegraph, which will then proxy them to Kafka and then written to InfluxDB. So as long as you have curl or w get on your machine, you can always get metrics into Telegram. And all I'm doing is passing in a JSON payload. So you see here we have uh, some value of one and some other value two. If I refresh, click on test, some value, some other value. One and two. So I can use curl to get metrics in. I can also use echo. Now show me a Linux machine that doesn't have echo and I'll call you a liar. But I can echo an arbitrary number using netcat to a Telegraph socket. So Telegraph can actually expose Unix sockets on the machine that you can echo metrics to. I jump back here, I click refresh. I have a socket listener, web value, hit submit, and there's 512 there. So there are infinite possibilities, no matter what infrastructure, operating system, architecture you're running, to get metrics from something to InfluxDB. The last thing I want to show you, because I know it's been a lot, is that we have so many people using Prometheus. Telegraph supports Prometheus too. So it can actually expose all of its metrics in the Prometheus format for you to scrape with Prometheus as well. I'm going to shut all that down because that was a dumb one. I'll wait in case there's questions. All right. Oh. So I've only covered 10 plugins <laughs> of the 250 or odd we're at just now. Um, everything I've done so far is online. All of the examples I've used today are on my GitHub repository. You know, feel free to go in, copy them, break them, clone them. That's my Twitter handle. Hopefully now um, you see how powerful Telegraph is and you can actually instrument it and use it in your own tooling. And I'm happy to take any more questions again. Thank you.
I know that demo's quite intense. There's a lot going on. Some people get it, some people don't. But mm. feel free just to ask as many questions as you want. For the buffering, so it means that you will only keep, you will drop the latest items. If you don't want to, like, so say you. If you hit the buffer limit, yes, yeah. they'll fall off. The oldest ones will fall off. Hopefully that's what I'm hoping that's what you would want. I think that's a good sensible default. Of, if I'm still writing stuff, that's probably stuff I want to keep. Any more questions? Is there any uh, data compression optimization on the buffer? Uh, I think everything lives in. Uh, it's all encoded in portal buffs and memory. InfluxDB is that way. I think Telegraph is the same, but I'm not 100 percent sure. Um, but Protobus is quite popular in the company, so I wouldn't be surprised if the in-memory format was Protobus. Um, but I'm not sure if there's any compression um, in that. But would be a good PR if there's not. <laughs> All right, again, thank you very much. I don't know what's happening next, so.